Um, hey, what's up, John? Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Um, you said you're in a hotel room. Is, is that the space room? Uh, no, I don't know. It's actually really shitty artwork that you can't even, you can't pull it off the wall. We've, we've tried. Um, <laughs> you but, have. <laughs> yeah, it's some kind of theme they got going on here. We're in Montana right now. Oh, I've always wanted to go there. I hear it's so beautiful. It is. It, uh, I had never been here. Um, my producer who you, you spoke to Jeremy, neither of us have been here, but it's, uh, it's, it's stunning. Yeah. It's really beautiful. Are you working? Yeah, we're prepping a movie. Uh, we're shooting and starting in two weeks. Is that the something red? No, Ida Red we shot already. We finished that. Um, we actually just delivered it yesterday or started delivering it yesterday. Um, this is Candyland. Oh my God. Wait, so I was I was stalking you, you know, to prep on uh, IMDb. And I, uh, and I saw the log line about Candyland and I got really excited because I saw that lot lizards dock. Is that what, are you allowed to talk about this? I can, I can uh, a talk a little, bit, a little bit about it. Yeah. Okay. I, I got so excited for some reason. I, I just, first of all, I love like the worlds that you play in. Um, and I get that this is going to be a little all over the place, but like, you know, like you just don't see cool movies that much anymore. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Your vibe and everything that you do is like the stuff that I loved growing up watching, you know, um, that I feel like has been lost a little. So when I saw, you know, I saw Body Brokers and I thought that was really fun. And then when I started to look at the kind of stuff that you make and what your production company makes, I got really excited. Um, and uh, specifically the lot lizards, because I watched that documentary and like, it was so interesting to me. Uh, I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I'm, I'm curious if that inspired you or if you like pulled up on a truck stop or what the story yeah. is behind well, it. I'm from Oklahoma where, uh, you know, one of our main uh, exports is lot lizards. Uh, and, uh, you know, lot lizards, meth, Bible, beef, guns. Yeah. Uh, and uh, teen pregnancy, we do that well. Um, so, I mean, I've, uh, you know, <laughs> anyway, uh, but, you know, in my time using um, before I got sober, you know, I, uh, I had a lot of friends that, uh, you know, made money in creative ways. Uh, some of them were lot lizards. Um, and I always thought they were just like, it was just such a great title, first of all, but also like such an interesting existence i thought um i knew a few girls that were you know uh, descendants of truck drivers and then became lot lizards uh and i just thought that was fascinating and you know we i've never made a horror movie um i thought it like the more i started kind of watching them i, I didn't watch them a lot as a kid either because they never really scared me but after making yeah body brokers and run with the hunted and ida red uh there was something really liberating I found in horror because rules don't really apply mm -hmm. and uh and when I was thinking about a concept for a horror movie I I, I always wanted to make a movie about lot lizards so um it just kind of seemed like the perfect marriage for a story you know yeah that was interesting when I saw that it is a horror movie because I'm you know then I'm like running my imagination like what could the horror version of that be right I assume it's like the wrong truck someone gets into. No, it's actually not. I didn't want to do the typical. Um, the typical thing. So, I mean, really the way we've described it and how I conceived it was like an X-rated John Hughes movie. Um, so like, you know, pop culture references and like really try to make it fun um, with also really pushing the envelope with the horror and uh, and the other subject matter that's a little taboo, um, you know, that you could imagine would take place in a movie about lot lizards. So, uh, yeah, it's not. I don't want to reveal too much about it, but it's it's going to be a lot of fun. It's it's honestly the, my my favorite script I've ever written, and um, you know, unanimously everybody's really excited about it who's involved. So, I'm so excited to see it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, and are you using any real? lizards <laughs> uh no you know uh, we're in Montana. if i were in oklahoma I, I think you know we'd have a whole lot of 
we'd have generations of lizards, uh, you know, roaming the set. Uh, but uh, but it's kind of uncharted territory up here. And but it's all friends. You know, everybody who's in the movie is a friend of mine or Jeremy's. Uh, you know, most of the crew we've worked with before or friends of people we have. So it's I'm really excited to do this movie because it's it's going to be kind of the most family um uh it's gonna be like a you know the most family vibe familial vibe i've had on a set i think so it'll be a lot of fun that's cool so you typically then work with like the same crew that you've been i mean i know you've done like a bunch of films at this point are you when you say like family vibe is that because you're you know you built those relationships and you're using the same people or yeah i mean this this one we're actually using some new folks on the crew um we we have kept some and uh are kind of trying out new people in other positions but in terms of the cast i mean it's you know i wrote it I, ironically almost everybody i wrote um the roles for is actually going to play it and and they're all you know friends of my wife's or mine or jeremy's so uh you know in that regard it's going to be you know, it'll be a pretty relaxed set, you know, where there's not a lot of egos or then everybody's just kind of there to do the same thing and tell the best story possible. So. Nice. Yeah. So I want to backtrack a little. I love that you're from Tulsa. Uh, I, I know a couple of people from out there and I feel like so many creative people come from there. I've mm -hmm. never been there, but I have like this thing in my head about it just because it sounds really cool. Um, and I know Larry Clark is from there and, right. uh, um are are the are uh utah and opal kind of inspired from another day in paradise a little because they have those vibes to me and yeah. i just watched that movie for the first time so the reference is in my head i love that movie yeah uh, um so maybe but i i didn't really think about that you know but but jeremy points it out a lot where, where he'll read a script and be like or see the finished product and be like that's directly from this movie and i'm like <laughs> I, I didn't know that but it definitely is uh subconsciously it just you know mm -hmm. permeates and uh and you know i think i love movies like that that you know directly homage inspiration i i find my films in my opinion have have matured and gotten better the more i embrace my influences and things that i uh you know, instead of trying to hide from them or, you know, stray away from it, I think embracing it is, is really cool and leads to a, a more interesting story most of the time. So. Yeah. Yeah. It totally. And it had like a little bit of like a Badlands vibe, but then it turned into something else. But I'd sure. say just the beginning, like I was like, Oh, I like, I love these characters because they remind me of like, you know, these like runaway nineties kind of right. people. Not to, not to jump around, but I'm jumping around so much. So just we're, we're taking free. that whole that whole vibe from the front end of Body Brokers, and that's really all Candyland is going to be. Because mm. I really I had so much fun doing that, and and the way we shot, you know, the opening, I don't know, 17 minutes of Body Brokers was predominantly all handheld, and and felt just very like uh, I don't know. I love like early Gus Van Sant movies too, and it all feels kind of like that, um, or at least that was the intent. So yeah, in terms of, I love that part of the movie too. And, uh, yeah. and you know, I wanted to kind of live more in that space with this thing we're about to do, so. I love that. Um, okay, so yeah, again, I'm jumping around Tulsa. So what is it like there? Because yeah, if, I feel like so many people I know out in LA who work in the business are from there. Um, was it, is it, but then I also hear like other versions of people's lives, like, it seems like there's some people who were very like creative and other people who are just like doing the craziest shit. <laughs> like I hear such a mix of craziness. I'm curious about what it was like growing up for you there. Uh, it was, you know, it's, uh, it's very, it's changed a lot since I was a kid. Um, it's kind of always, you know, 10 years behind everything that's happening coastally, you know, or like, uh, at least in New York or LA, um, you know, like I think kids were wearing Jinkos until I was like, you know, 18 years old, you know, and, uh, and, you know, very slowly like uh, style and fashion kind of, you know, made its way. Um, but, you know, when I was growing up and it still is extremely religious and, uh, you know, it was much more um, conservative and felt much more like a small town then, then it's kind of changing a lot now. I think there's been a lot of, uh, you know, there's, there's a few like 
pretty eccentric uh, billionaires that live there and are from there. And they poured a lot of money into the town to kind of help build up the infrastructure and attract a lot of young people. And they've done a good job, but it's changed a lot. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, you'd have to, maybe you'll tell me after this, who, you know, in the film business from Tulsa, I only know Bill Hader and Gary Busey and uh, Larry Clark. Like, I think that's kind of the only people. And I know Josh Fadum. Uh, yeah. Josh yeah. was one of the people in mine. Yeah. I don't know him, but, um, but I know he's from there and uh, went to school with, I think my cousin or something, but, um, but yeah, it, it, it is a weird place that has um, a really interesting history and uh, a lot of people have passed through there and you know i uh, i'm proud to be from there you know we, we've shot a lot of our movies there and i've spent you know a lot of time there in the last five or six years so this this montana thing's been really interesting to kind of break out and um you know explore new territory but uh yeah i i i love tulsa obviously the older i get the more i think i um appreciate it i wanted to get out uh you know my whole childhood i just wanted to leave and uh it ended up becoming a pretty big cornerstone of my uh, career in terms of um you know really using the resources i had there to make these movies so yeah because your first movie was made there right with yeah I mean, my first uh four movies yeah oh. yeah so everything but this one um you know body brokers was uh about 25 percent of it was in los angeles but the rest of it was all in tulsa oh that's cool yeah were the rehabs in where were those um, that was like so, a hotel room looking one though well, that was actually, I, I'm really proud of the job we did. And I was surprised with how, how well we pulled off cheating LA for, uh, or Tulsa for LA. Those okay. were, those were, um, so the big auditorium um, was in, in kind of the grounds where Utah and uh, Wood are outside and he offers them the money. Those were in Los Angeles and uh, Calabasas actually mm -hmm. um, at King Gillette Ranch, but everything else was in Oklahoma at, at you know, I think one or two homes, um, we kind of, you know, piece together to make look like a rehab. Yeah, I started working in recovery as a sober companion in mm -hmm. October for like good money in that. I bet you're I, doing well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a good side job while, yeah. you know, I wait for other things. But um yeah, and I was like, where the fuck is that rehab? <laughs> I was yeah. like, there's no rehab that looks like a hotel. I yeah. liked what you did for the interior, but I know it's like painting the picture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I've been, I've been to quite a few rehabs and uh, I feel like they're getting more and more um, uh, creative with the spaces they use for these places. You know, some, uh, the last one I was in, they just rented a house mm -hmm. and, you know, put a bunch of bunk beds in some rooms and it was like a rehab all of a sudden, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, it, it looked pretty similar to the, to the way we shot, you know, the, or the rooms in a house we shot, body brokers in so you know but i've been in the institutional ones that are you know much more um you know dodgy and uh and lower end too so yeah like yeah. yellowstone um is that <laughs> I, I don't know i honestly I've, I've been to probably 12 uh the worst really to, yeah, the worst i went to were in florida those were really really something yeah yeah i I'm sober too, but I never went to rehab. I always wanted to go, but my mom wouldn't pay for me to go. She's like, just fucking go to, you know, 12 step. And, uh, so I'm always like, I'm jealous. So, okay. Are you, are you cool talking about sobriety? Sure. Sorry. I'm jumping around again. I'm going to stop apologizing. Um, okay. So you went 12 times, obviously something wasn't working. Like, what do you think that change was? Uh, you know, more than anything, it was just me not being ready to, to mm -hmm. really do it. And, you know, the first few times I went to rehab weren't to get sober. They were to get away from, you know, some serious trouble I got myself into. And I wanted to, you know, I, once I found out that rehabs, they couldn't reveal that you were there, uh, even to law enforcement. So, or, or, you know, in my case, like other criminals. So I, I felt like, oh, that's a safe place for me to just go and stay uh and nobody will know where i am so that's kind of how it started me going to treatment that's um, smart yeah i thought so too and it worked out <laughs> uh, but uh but thank yeah, you HIPAA. I, yeah right right so i did that and um you know i did the same thing every time uh where you know i'd go i'd put together like 60 or 90 days um i'd find a uh 
another broken person, you know, preferably a, a, a female uh, that, you know, didn't want to be there either. And we'd, we'd leave and go do our thing, you know, and it was just a cycle I went through where I'd kind of get material things back. You know, I'd get some new clothes, I'd get a little bit of money, I'd get a girlfriend, I'd leave. And then mm -hmm. uh, I did that same thing, I don't know, for, you know, quite a long time. Until, yeah, how many years were you? Uh, I think it was close to like, must have been probably over like six years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably over six years um, or right around six years. Yeah. And then the last time it just got really, really bad. And I got, I, I finally, um, you know, did some things that I was, I was really scared I was going to get in trouble for. And yes, uh, go on. Well, no, just, you know, things that it just, it was not, um, not, not good, not good, you know, and, and I, and there were serious, uh, repercussions if I had gotten, you know, caught for doing them. So that, that happened, I got really scared. And then I also just ended up, I was living in a, uh, in like an abandoned building in New Jersey and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, smoking crack and doing dope. And, uh, and I was just tired. I was over it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I kind of, I kind of, uh, checked every thing off the list that I said I'd never do, you know, at that point and, and, and then done and then some, and, uh, you know, I'd hurt a lot of my, like, you know, a few of the closest friends that had stuck by me, I'd hurt them. And, uh, I just felt terrible. So I called somebody and I got into treatment and, uh, it wasn't, I, I didn't even really stay in treatment for very long. I was only there for about 10 days and then they kicked me out. But I, out of like spite was like, I'm going to get sober to prove you wrong. And, uh, I met my, I, my wife is sober. Um, I ended up just moving in with her as, uh, we do and, um, uh, never left, you know? So we, yeah, so, uh, yeah, but that's kind of like, you know, in a, in a quick little nutshell, what happened. Yeah. But yeah, I went to, I, I utilized the program and, uh, you know, 12 step program to, you know, and I met a lot of people there. And, uh, you know, once, once I kind of embraced that those people don't want anything from me, except for me to succeed, um, you know, my life changed, you know, so. When you were staying in Florida, you were in some of the more shadier places. Right. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So, I mean, first of all, um, you know, I remember I was, uh, I was living in, in New Jersey a time and, you know, I got into some trouble and I kept running out of money and I, you know, uh, I was just kept getting really, really dope sick and I was tired of it. And so one night you know, I like Google on my phone, like drug treatment, whatever. Uh, cause I didn't have any money. I didn't have insurance. And, um, you know, they have such good like data tracking on those searches that they just start calling you. It, even if you, you know, yeah. if you click on the wrong website, like they have your information. So anyway, <laughs> I kept getting these calls and um, I ended up kind of kicking dope on my own. I was about four or five days sober at that time. I wouldn't, I mean, I was just without drugs. I, I wouldn't yeah. say that I was even sober, but um, this guy kept calling me from this treatment center in Florida and checking on me. He seemed really nice. And, uh, Eventually I was like, I don't know how I'm going to, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Even if I do get sober, I can't pay my rent. I, I don't have a job. Um, I didn't know what to do. So I was like, fuck it. I'll just go to treatment. And uh, so eventually like after like four or five days of kicking dope, um, this guy called again. I was like, all right, man, I'll come. Like, just tell me what I need to do. And he was like, well, when was the last time you used? And I was like, um, four or five days ago and he was like okay well that's a problem because you've got to show up and, and piss dirty if you don't piss dirty then like you can't be admitted and I was like okay well he was like do you have any money and I was like no um and he was like all right well I'm gonna buy you a plane ticket and I'm gonna Western Union use some money right now to go get a cab to the airport and I was like oh okay sounds great and he was like but you can't show up and piss clean and I was like okay. I don't know how I'm going to figure that out. He was like, just go to the Western union. So I show up at the Western union and there's like a thousand dollars in the Western union for me. And, uh, and like, 
and the, and the cab ride was only like 60 bucks so i was like what the fuck does this guy want me to do so i went out he wants you to get so high uh, yeah so i bought <laughs> all sorts of stuff and i had like i called the cab and the cab just drove me around like you know to all the spots met all the people got everything i needed and i drove to the airport and just got so high and then uh i got off the plane um in fort lauderdale or west palm one of the two and they had a driver there ready to take me and he was like do you have anything else and i was like is that a trick question and he was like no it's not i just need to know because like we'll pull off somewhere he's like you need beer or anything and i was like sure yeah all right so we pulled off and like i just sat in the car with this cab guy or he was he was like more of like a, he was wearing a suit and uh i just sat there and smoked crack and did the rest of my drugs and drank a 40 or whatever he bought me. And, uh, because if you drink, if you show up, you know, and piss for, uh, for alcohol, you get even more drugs when you show up and anybody who's been to rehab knows that like, they'll give you, you know, other things. Um, and this guy, you know, figured I knew that. So, um, so yeah, I showed up there and this place was like, it was like a total, it was like, I mean, I think most of the people were on like some kind of release from prison where they had worked it out, where they'd just go, um, you know, instead of finishing their sentence in prison, they would just go to this treatment center. So my roommate was a guy who had done 35 years for murder. Um, and, you know, uh, I showed up and they take me to my room and it's like plastic sheets and they have plastic sheets. Yeah. It was like the, the really like the ones in case you shit your pants or, or okay. piss your head. Like it's, you know, like a know. detox sort yeah, of setup. Yeah. So, okay. so, so I showed up and they walked me into my room and there's this big ass Samoan guy who walked me in my room and I go into my room and my roommates, like he's probably, I don't know. He, I think he was in his sixties and uh, just ripped black dude. And he's just sitting on top of his sheets, butt naked and like <laughs> reading a book. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I don't know where I am right now. I was so high. I was like, this is hysterical. And, uh, and I got in bed, I just sat my stuff down on my bed and the Samoan guys, it was one of those places where because of the violent criminals that were in there, but also because of the suicide rate at the, at the institution, they had one-on-ones with you at all times. So I had to have somebody with me 24 hours a day within arm's reach. And so did my, my buddy and uh, my roommate. So anyway, that was kind of my introduction to this place. And also like I have Crohn's disease. And so I, I couldn't eat their like boiled meat that they would serve. It like made me so ill. So they bought me a block of tofu that was about the size of a shoe box. And they said, just keep this in your room whenever you're hungry, eat it. Keep it in your room? <laughs> yeah, so I had was a there a fridge? Of- no, there was no fridge. So it was like, what? It, was, uh, it was, uh, that's it was, crazy. Yeah, so it was, I mean, that's kind of the most extreme version of rehab I went to. Um, I loved and there hearing was, there about was it. multiple suicides while I was there. And, uh, and yeah, it was, it was really, uh, eye open. Like people killing other people or themselves? Uh, themselves. Yeah. Oh. Did yeah. you walk in on anything? Uh, one time like I people? saw one guy one guy i don't know if he succeeded in killing himself but you know they check out razors to you uh you know you check mm-hmm. it out and you have to turn it back in and he slashed himself with a razor and uh and they like they call it bacon wrapping is the term it's baker act where you like take somebody and you take them to a psych ward and you put them in a straight jacket but in the place they called it bacon wrapped so they bacon wrapped him and took him out and there was you know blood everywhere it was uh it was a, that was the last time I went to treatment uh, <laughs> and stayed. And then, you know, the, the time I got sober was, was after I, I got out of there and ended up going back to whatever I was doing. But, you know, by the time I was ready to finally, you know, really give up, uh, you know, that, that memory of that place was not too far away. So, uh, you know, I think it helped going to all those different treatment centers really, really helped me kind of get to my place where I was finally Uh, over it you know and I think it's important to point out that like the nice places aren't gonna make you want to change or get better those are like fucking vacations for people like you know a friend of mine has been to rehab like 60 times like so many times and she just goes to like all the nice places like in Malibu and shit and she literally refers to them as vacations so I think like those low bottom ones are really what you really need to like 
get the fucking message sometimes, you know, when it's been a while, like, it, yeah. Yeah. I had a girlfriend, um, you know, that she paid cash, her family paid cash for a place in Malibu, right on the beach, beautiful place. And because she paid cash, she could do whatever she wanted. I mean, mm -hmm. she could use, she'd walk around the house naked in front of all these people. And there was, I mean, the owner was just like, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's who she is, whatever, you know? And, uh, and so it's it was, who she is. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, uh, God bless her, but she, um, but it, it's, it's a really interesting, um, experience going to all those places. I'm, I'm glad I haven't been back, you know? So, but yeah. So the place you went to, is that place shut down now? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. I, I got a, like a call from them a few years ago to check and see how I was doing, but they do that, <laughs> you know, for their, uh, you know, client outreach or, or, or uh, whatever it is, outreach, um, alumni outreach or something like that. But uh, yeah. So. so was that your initial introduction into that world of body broker, junkie hunter? Um, right around there was, I remember, um, I can't remember chronologically when, but it was, it was either right before or after uh, somebody called me and said, hey, there's a girl coming to tour our treatment center and they knew that I knew her and they knew that she had a lot of money and, uh, or she came from a lot of money. And they said, if you can convince her to come to our place, you know, I'll pay you a check. I'll give you, you know, X amount of dollars cash. And, you know, I was using, so that seemed like a great deal to me. So I called this girl and I said, Hey, I heard you're going to tour this place. Um, it's great. I know the people and they were, they are, you know, they're nice people. I mean, they really tried to help me. So I didn't, I wasn't like lying. I just, you know, uh, kind of tried to help sell her on it. She ended up going there. They gave me a check and I was like, Oh, okay, this is, this is cool. And then, you know, at the place that my girlfriend at the time was, um, the owner there told me, he said, Hey, I know you, you know, a lot of people. So if you can get anybody to come here, um, you know, you see how we take care of you, you know, you do whatever you want. Um, if, if you can bring us anybody, I'll, I'll pay you. And so I brought like, I don't know. I brought like 10 or 12 people there and he paid me. And I was like, wow, this is, this is great. And, uh, I didn't think anything was wrong with it. Um, and so I, I did that a few other times, but you know, once I got sober, I, I really, I moved from LA uh, to upstate New York and really just tried to focus on, you know, my own recovery. And I got really far away from the whole treatment world and, and that whole existence. So it was kind of out of sight, out of mind. And, um, you know, a few years ago, uh, I was visiting my wife. Um, she was working on a film out in like uh, Slab City area. And I went and met up with some of my old friends from treatment. And they told me, they were like, hey, you, you know, you should really look into this body brokering. Like, you wouldn't believe what's happened. And I didn't, I didn't really want to go back into that whole world. I had no interest in making a movie about drugs. I really did the best I could to remove that from my life. But I reluctantly like met up with a few people and they started telling me, you know, how much money they were making. And these were like brokers, like lower end brokers. And I was intrigued. And then they introduced me to their boss uh, or the guy they worked for who they, you know, said was kind of the body broker. And <laughs> the body uh, broker. Can you describe yeah, what well, the body broker looks like? <laughs> yeah, I can. Uh, so I met him at a, at a West side hotel um it, it's not shutters it's the one right next door the red brick one um and i met him in a, a ocean view uh hotel room he had a bunch of food laid out for me and he had two guys that took my phone and uh you know like kind of patted me down and let me in to talk to him and he looked like a like a white rapper hip-hop type guy you know like it definitely um, you know, had that vibe, that street vibe to him. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I talked to him for like four or five hours and, you know, his story was really fascinating to me because it, it was a lot like, um, Utah's in a way where he came out to get sober. He really, that's what he, his intention was, was to come out and get clean and, you know, he was kind of turned out by, uh, by the treatment center itself. And so I identified with that too. And it, it kind of, I really empathized with him because I saw what he came to do and I saw how, 
you know, easily somebody, if, if, you know, when you finally get the courage to ask for help, you're so vulnerable. And like, you know, when you're really trying to change your life and you're at zero and desperate, like it, it's really the luck of the draw, what kind of people you come in contact with, because, you know, I've come in contact with the wrong people and I very quickly went back to doing the things I was doing and even worse. Um, you know, it took me multiple tries to, you know, give up surrender, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, on this last time, luckily I was around people that actually cared about me and my well being, and it really changed and altered my life completely. Um, but this guy, the, you know, the, the body broker that I, I was referring to, like he fell in with the wrong people. Um, and they just replaced his drug habit with, you know, money and selling other addicts. And, uh, he's really good at it. He said he made, you know, upwards of like 800 grand in a week at times um, What in California. Yeah. In California. Yeah. Because he, you know, he was also involved in the, um, the implants. He was one of the big people involved with all that. And that's where a lot of money, you know, is. I didn't even know about that. Yeah. um, Until I saw it in the movie and then I was like, I guess that's going on too. I mean, there's so much that I'm naive to that I didn't even realize was going on. Um, and it's so eye opening. And I, part of the reason why, like, I wanted to talk to you and, um, why also, talk to Ali Severino, you know, who she is. I'm assuming you watched those documentaries, American Relapse and- No, I've never seen them. Oh, you didn't? No. Um, it's about all this stuff. And it, they're in uh, in Delray Beach in Florida, like, you know, finding people off the street and stuff and getting them in. And, right. Um, and I didn't realize like, you know, it, it affects me so much because it's like after working in recovery for a little bit, like I, I just, I don't like anyone being taken advantage of. Like, I think that's like, you know, probably like a deeper thing in me. Like I always like have the fear of like getting got, you know, something obviously happened to me in childhood where why I feel that way. But like, I just like, I want to bring this to light more because I think it's so fucked up. And, you know, obviously I can't like speak a lot on it, but like I've seen fucked up things that have really upset me, you know, witnessing in the recovery world, like uh, treatment wise. And like, it, I don't know, I just find it like interesting and disturbing and, and fucked up. So like, you know, I think it's important to get it out there and talk about it more. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. And, and like exactly what you said, just like, you know, when people are in such a vulnerable place and abusing and taking advantage of them and bribing them with money like it's um it's very sick and disturbing to me yeah yeah um that's crazy though about the implants thing too I didn't even know that I like there's so much going on in that whole world that like people don't even know you know and it's just like I feel like I'm skimming above the surface and there's like a whole like you know almost like a dark web world of all that shit yeah, it was hard with when writing the movie because you know there's, there's yeah like you said and there's so many other layers to it. But you know, uh, with the film being an hour and fifty some odd minutes, like you can't fit everything into it. So it was uh it was hard to fully explain everything and also knowing when to kind of pull back and not go too deep because you know you'll lose people if you start really bombarding them with too much information. Um, and, you know, the truth is stranger than fiction a lot of the time, especially in this case, you know. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, you know, when, when we, when people kind of first started seeing the movie, they were like, so this is real? Like, they could, they didn't really believe that it was real. And um, we kind of had to reiterate that a few times with uh, certain groups of people. But, yeah, it's, uh, there's a lot to it. So. I thought you did a great fun. job of explaining it. And, um And I didn't even, even you just saying like, it's almost two hours, like it flew by so fast. It, you know, like some movies are like, oh, there's a two hour movie. Like (laughs) your movie felt like an hour and a half. Well, that's good. I mean, (laughs) you know, the best part about the, uh, the reception of the movie is that anybody like yourself, uh, who's familiar with this world or, you know, has a connection to this world, uh, you know, through a family member, um, has, really uh validated its accuracy you know and and you know didn't feel like it was long uh you know i find that people that that don't have a connection to this you know they're they're it's it's such it's so foreign to them that um 
you know, I'm not really sure how they've received it, but we like, we didn't make this for them. So it's been, uh, it's been nice to have people like you reach out and show your support. Yeah. Fuck those people. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Go watch a Pixar movie, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually my therapist watched it too. Cause I was talking to her about the documentary, but she watched the film. Oh, cool. But, yeah. So have fun. Um, yeah. yeah. Have people reached out to you a lot? I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, you know, it's been really cool, you know, like uh, the character of May, um, who plays like mm, the girl mm-hmm. the center who ends up kind of falling in love with Utah. The girl I based that off of loosely, uh, you know, reached out to me uh, like a few weeks ago and said, the iPod. She just wrote the iPod because she gave <laughs> me an iPod when I was in treatment center. And I used that little, you know, thing to kind of link them together and like, so a lot of the people that have that knew uh, or played a part in my recovery definitely reached out. But then, you know, I'm not on social media, but Jeremy has been getting, uh, you know, like droves of, uh, you know, people reaching out and telling us how much it, it meant to them or thank you for finally exposing this story. This happened to me and nobody believed it. And uh, yeah, and then parents, you know, this is, you know, mm-hmm. they, they lost their children because of body brokering. So it's been overwhelming the support we've gotten um with the film it's it's far exceeded our expectations the ending was so sad i just thought of that when you said the parents because i imagine you know when he's sitting in the car yeah not to ruin yeah yeah sad wait ending. so that happened with may like did you get to hook up with someone who worked at a uh, no center? no i didn't i embellished that part a little bit for the story <laughs> but but she became a very good friend of mine, this girl. And it was actually the first time I went to treatment. Um, she was the first person I met. It's a very similar interaction that happened between Utah and May. And um, I don't know, I just, I developed like a kinship with this girl and and she was around my age and, uh, and knew I was like a fish out of water. And uh, I was a painter at the time and she you know, came to my room one night and gave me an iPod and said, Hey, I've unlocked the garage and go in there and whatever. And I went in there and there was, there was a canvas and there was paint she had brought. And like, you know, it was, it was a really nice gesture because mm. I wasn't sure I was going to stay. And, uh, and it kept me there. Um, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, anyway, that kind of found its way into the script and it was, it was nice to see that uh she saw the movie i hadn't talked to her in a few years and reached out and you know we had a nice little catch up about it but yeah so her the therapist um you know based those it's 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 there's a lot of people uh that these characters directly were influenced by so what about the house that had all the addicts at it and the woman oh yeah i I didn't know what to call what what like what would you it wasn't like a I mean, it was just like addicts hanging out at a house. Yeah, I mean, so so what's happened in in California is that, uh, you know, a lot of these body brokers have now set up these homes where, you know, you know, they're they're paying clients, they're incentivizing these addicts to go to treatment, obviously not for the right reasons, these kids just want the money. So it's like, hey, go to treatment for 30 days or 60 days. And when you get out, I'll pay you and you can come stay at my house. And you can use until your money's up and then you'll go back in and we'll just do it again. And so a lot of these guys have set up these kind of, yeah, they're kind of flop houses, uh, you know, where they go and they, you know, they kind of, they can stay as long as they want until they're done using. And then they just go back into treatment. That's fucking crazy. I didn't even like, I, I feel like so naive being like, I didn't expect that in California. It's like, I want to put this all on Florida, (laughs) you know, Mm because like for some reason it makes sense to me that that happens in South Florida because of like the whole opioid epidemic and everything going on. Like it's all been like labeled as like Florida is where all that happens, you know? Right. Right. But then it's like, I don't, I don't know why, like, it's shocking to me that that's happening in LA and even, like, still happening, you know? Like, I know that it is, I guess. I know things have changed um, with, like, all the regulations going on, but, like, like my husband, a friend of his owns, um, like, a rehab and some sober livings, and, like, 
I guess he was like, oh yeah, it's not like it used to be like five years ago when they would make like tons of fucking money. Um, yeah, I don't think that's true uh, entirely. They just kind of changed the language. So, you know, I, I think now um, my understanding is it used to be that you would be paid per client. So now it's like, now you can do a direct deal with a treatment center where it's like, oh, you can, if you bring me X amount of clients, I'll pay you this amount of money. But it's more of an umbrella thing where you have an, a, a deal with a treatment center with bonuses if you bring more. So it's it's really just like a semantics change now. Um, but at least that's my understanding, you know, so. Yeah, I took like a intervention training course or whatever. And they were talking about ethics and they're like, is it okay to accept like basketball tickets to get a client into a rehab? And I was like, no, of course not. And some people were like, oh, it's not. You know, it was like a large Zoom of like many people, but I was like, right. how, like, I'm assuming we're all on the same page, everyone. And right. it, I don't know, it's just crazy to me that people who are sober and like, I mean, I feel like those people aren't really sober too. Like, did you find that those people like identified as sober, but there are people who are like essentially dry and don't go to meetings or there's like the level of those scummy people who are in meetings, but like they're pieces of shit. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody who's um, who's doing this kind of stuff is is truly uh, uh, yeah, working a, a program and like spiritually fit and all those kind of things that uh, you know, I guess you attribute to an actual sober person. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I feel like most uh, most of the people, yeah, are are just not using. They just you know substituted drugs for whatever, like you know, making money. Um, you know, I mean, but I, I really empathize with that, you know, and, and a lot of these people, you know, the perceived villains and especially in the movie is, uh, because I know myself and I feel like left to my own devices, uh, you know, I'd take the basketball tickets, you know, I'd be like, yeah, fuck it, whatever, <laughs> you know, but I, so I, I understand how, you know, people can, you know, fall, you know, uh, get, get attracted to greed and like, you know, all these things. And, um, you know, so I, I empathize with those people. I also know, but for me, I have to, uh, I have to work that much harder to be, you know, the best version of myself. Um, and I admire the people like you who, you know, right off the bat know it's wrong, you know? Um, so <laughs> I was, I didn't always have integrity for some reason but, I do with this, but like, I was a bad person for a very long time. You know, what, what I feel like is a bad person in terms of like the life choices I was making and the life I was living and my lifestyle. And like, you know, I have a lot of guilt and shame around my past. You know, I was a stripper for three years when I was in college and, you know, had a lot of shady stuff going on with that. And like, you know, um, it's like, you know, when you're, when you get sober, it's like, you kind of have this stuff that's like implemented into your body. And like the more time you get sober and in recovery, like I look back at that with like a stain on myself. And it's like, you have to do all this work to be like, you're actually not like a bad person now, you know? Mm -hmm. And like all that kind of shit. Like, do you, like you had talked about, you know, running with like a crew and stuff and getting into a lot of trouble, like in terms of the work that you've done since you've gotten sober, like what has that been like? And have you had like a similar experience with like getting rid of maybe like old beliefs about yourself and stuff like that? Yeah, sure. I, uh, I, I never was one of those people that like hated myself. Um, I, you know, I think, uh, I, uh, you know, I've had a, a God complex or an ego or whatever for, you know, as long as I can remember. So I never had a problem with like not liking myself. Um, but I did feel shame and guilt around the things that I had done that hurt other people around me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I kind of just, you know, the, I, I learned, you know, about the whole living amends thing where like, you know, I need to just, I can't go back and necessarily write all the wrongs from my past. Um, even by, you know, uh, making a formal amends to somebody directly. Um, the best thing I can do is just continue to be honest and, uh, you know, the, the, the best version of myself every day. You know, it's, you know, a lot of people, it took years for them to kind of warm back up to me, you know, mm -hmm. and, and see that the change had happened and rightfully so, you know, so it's been a really interesting experience. Um, 
but again, I've, I've, you know, I kind of remove myself from, you know, any old, uh, anything that would inspire old habits to come back. You know, I moved across the country up to the woods, uh, with my wife and, uh, quickly just like plugged into, you know, the, uh, the program up there. So really the only people I knew for like the first three or four years of my sobriety were people in recovery, you know, and that was really key for me to separate myself from seeing people that expected me to be a different version of myself or the old version of myself that I was trying to separate from. So, you know, I, I've been pretty diligent about all that. And my wife is like, uh, she's, she's very sober and works a very, very, uh, rigid program. And so there's not a lot of, uh, leeway for me to, to, <laughs> to be lax, you know? Uh, yeah. yeah, she's like the sober Gestapo and, <laughs> uh, and she's great. And, um, so that, that was key for me also, but, you know, um, I don't know, you know, making amends, I did go through and do like the direct amends process, uh, process, you know, you know, in the steps. And uh, that was where I found the most growth for me personally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of atoning for those things that I had done. And, you know, most of the time, people had forgotten, or, you know, when I told them they didn't care. Uh, and there was there was a few exceptions to that. But most of the time, I had to learn that, me apologizing to them wasn't for them, it was for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to like hold myself accountable for those things I'd done. So that was where I saw the most growth in terms of me changing and, um, you know, really kind of becoming uh, a new person, so. Yeah, I also found that when I made events that the things that I thought were the small things were received in like such a bigger way. Like right. almost like these people have been waiting for an apology for me to be a bad roommate in college. Right. <laughs> like so thankful. And I was like, oh shit, sorry. Right. Or like the throwaway ones. Um, that's funny. Yeah, my husband's sober. It's, it's so nice to be married to someone who's also in recovery and looks at their shit. Um, I know that we have a couple of minutes left and I kind of skipped over this, but I was curious about like, just like the earlier days and like how you kind of got started. Like, were you always um, wanting to like be both the writer and director of like the things that you're making? Like, it seems like you pretty much were always the writer and director on all your films. Yeah, I mean, uh, I didn't really have a, a blueprint or an idea of how to make any of this happen. Um, you know, Jeremy and I always, uh, err on the side of doing everything ourselves or as much as we can. Um, because I don't know any other way to get it done. Neither does he. And, uh, so when I started, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a script, uh, that became my first film and, you know, I didn't know how to get it made. Um, I had never worked on a movie set before. So, you know, I casted everybody, uh, you know, we did all the wardrobe shopping, we did all the scouting, we did everything. And, um, and, you know, I found that to be the best way for me to work and get things done. Because if the minute I rely on somebody that I don't know, uh, is the minute I'm fucked, you know, mm -hmm. because they're not going to do things the way I would do them or the pace I would do them. And they're not going to match my my care or Jeremy's care or either of our work ethic. Um, so, yeah, it, it kind of happened by default that way. And, um, you know, admittedly, I, I feel like I've, you know, I've learned through my mistakes um, as a writer and a director. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy the process of, I enjoy the whole process of filmmaking a lot. And uh, and so I, I don't know, I've continued to write and direct and, you know, um, continued that until now, so. Yeah. When you said you learned from you your mistakes, you is there anything that kind of sticks out for you as valuable lessons to repeat to the listener? Um, yeah, I mean, it's like a day thing. Um, it's a lot like, it's amazing how much, uh, you know, the filmmaking process reflects the process of sobriety and like the whole, uh, you know, for me at least, um, you know, learning mistakes, uh, being accountable, being honest with yourself and others around you. I mean, all these things that eventually, if you're not, if you don't do 
in the process of making a film, you're going to pay for them later or, you know, there's no way to really fix them later. So, um, you know, for me, it's the, the thing I've, I've, I think I've, uh, abided by the most is keeping the people you trust close and keeping your circle small and trusting yourself and trusting the little, um, you know, the minute you kind of let a committee in to make a decision is the minute you're going to regret whatever decisions made, you know, because it's not yours or it's not, you know, um, of that type of group that's all setting out to do the same thing. Um, you know, with a film, it's, it's really just Jeremy and I, uh, and then everybody else is, we're, is coming on to help us, but they're not going to living with this thing. Um, and their name's not going to be on it forever. And, uh, you know, if it's bad, they're embarrassed about it for the rest of their life, you know? Um, but when it's good, everybody takes fucking ownership. So <laughs> I've got to, you know, remember that, you know? So. Um, yeah. It sounds like you're pretty keeping... good about like protecting yeah. your vision because, you know, you saying that you and Jeremy kind of make everything like yourselves. Yeah. And then I'm sure like, once you're adding like a finance or something like everyone wants to have like a fucking opinion. So like, how do you, I mean, I'm sure what you just said is part of it, but is there any, like, how do you kind of instill that tr like trust and create that for yourself for you to just do your thing? Uh, well, I think, you know, in terms of the financer and all that, I mean, Jeremy's done a pretty good job of, uh, of limiting any language that uh, gives them in at all <laughs> as to like what they can, <laughs> can you know, uh, say they would like to look like or be. So it kind of starts there in that regard. But then in terms of, um, you know, with our actors, it's just, you know, I, I like collaborating with people. And I think, you know, usually the idea is the third idea where it's like, oh, I have this idea. You have that idea. Well, what comes out discussing both of those is usually a good, like, you know, the best of the ideas, but knowing that, you know, I've made the mistake enough of deferring a decision to somebody else and being in the editing room later and being like, you know, God damn it. I shouldn't have done that. You know, it really boils down. There is a mistake. I want it to be mine. Mm. You know um, I don't like, I, you know, a, a big, my, my sobriety is, is not being a victim um, and not blaming other people for anything because I am responsible for all things in my life. Um, and if I'm responsible for things that happen, I'm responsible for how I deal with them. So, you know, in terms of the filmmaking process, it's kind of the same, you know, I want to be responsible if there's a mistake and uh, you know, it makes it hard to defer, uh, you know, and let other people do their job. But um, you know, it's a, work in progress whole theory I guess so and did you start filmmaking before you were sober or is that something that came after yeah no it, it started before I made a short film uh um back in fuck I don't even know how long ago it was uh, I made a feature film after that and I was not sober and since then um starting with Rome with the Hunted and uh Every film since I've, yeah, I've been, those were made. Yeah. Cool. Well, I guess that's well, all I have. Uh, thank you so much, John, for taking the time and coming on. And thank you. It's great to talk to you. And I'm so excited for Candyland too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm really excited. So yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, for helping us get the word out about this movie. For sure. Um, have a good shoot. And uh, yep. Yeah. Thank you.